Yeah, and we're going to touch on a little bit of both perspectives from the worker and the owner um, with independent contractor arrangements. We're going to talk about, you know, what are the rules um, or really guidelines? How are these things generally classified? And what are the risks of misclassifying them? And the overlay here is, you know, the risk reward picture. Um, what are uh, we're not going to get into any details about the tax advantages, but that's going to be a backdrop. And, you know, and overall, what are the efficiencies that you should be as a, as an owner trying to achieve? And, and that really kind of boils down to aligning the, the worker and the owner goals in a way that's, that's logical, particularly with, um, compensation and also ties back to these classifications and helps you support what it is you're trying to do. So, uh, third slide. Great. Yeah. And, and I would encourage people just jump in, jump in as we go. You have your own unique circumstance. If you want to get it off your chest, like with rock and roll, get it off our chest, recognizing that of course, David's a lawyer, so he's going to have a disclaimer. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, Make your disclaimer. Great. Yeah, I wouldn't be a lawyer if I didn't give you. Yeah, uh, of course. Um, I'm I'm not a tax advisor. I'm not. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm, Scott is on on the line, but he's probably going to say a lot of the same things if you ask him a direct question. Um, I'm a business attorney, uh, but importantly, I'm not your business attorney. And every legal situation is really case by case. It's fact and it's locally specific. So it's important to establish attorney-client relationships and talk about these things within the context of what you are doing. We're going to talk high level today and try to get you guys um, in a position where you can ask more informed questions of your advisors. Um, you also be aware of the issue of privilege. So unless and until you formalized an arrangement uh, or an engagement agreement with an attorney, you don't have an attorney-client privilege. Um, and uh, suffice it to say that nothing that you say here on this um, uh, webcast today is privileged. And so, you know, we do want to encourage questions and dialogue. But if you have specific questions, let's treat them as hypotheticals for your friend. Okay. Um, so let's get into it. I'm going to run through this pretty quickly. Uh, please. Uh, again, interrupt if you have questions, but know that we're going to leave a lot of time at the end for Q&A as well. Um, fourth slide. And, okay. So why does this matter? You know, what are the risks and rewards? Um, rewards. So, you know, typically the reward is principally on the worker side. They're the ones that are usually, you know, if you're having a discussion about it, should I be an independent contractor or should I be an employee? Um, it's usually a somewhat informed um, worker that is asking for this arrangement, principally because they want the ability to push them. Otherwise, personal quasi-business related expenses in a pass-through entity such as a single member LLC and reduce their taxable income. Um, and a legitimate independent contractor you know should be able to do that they can expense you know their phone and internet certain meals and entertainment expenses mileage take a home office deduction etc um, in appropriate situations there's some benefits to the employer as well i mean they could reduce their fully loaded staffing expenses uh, by having a you know a proper independent contractor arrangement that has a different compensation structure, um, and ideally you know, they can really enhance their efficiency goals with the compensation arrangement. For example, a well structured statement of work for an independent contractor with specific milestone payments for actual performance um, can be. A great thing uh, but the risks are significant uh, much more so for the employer uh, or the owner why well they've got a bigger bullseye you know common sense dictates that um, 
whether it's IRS revenue officers in the US, um, state and local agencies, uh, they're much more likely to go after you know, the, the mom and dad, so to speak, and not the kids. Uh, companies have deeper pockets. There's a public interest in holding uh, employers responsible for knowing the rules, et cetera. Um, and owners, employers should also be aware of you know, what I call the grand jury effect. So once uh, you know, one of these agencies is in the door, their investigation could go other places and likely would, particularly if you don't have um, experience, legal and accounting advisors um, kind of setting the parameters and, and guiding you through um, you know, such an, an inquiry. And um, you know, owners should be cognizant of other ancillary effects of a misclassification uh, of, a, of a contractor. Um, if you're likely to have investors in the future, um, or if you're looking for an exit, like selling the company, they're gonna come in and they're gonna do due diligence and you know, they're gonna look at your staffing arrangements and you know, if they see something that, hey, you know, this just doesn't look and feel and smell like it should be an independent contractor, it can create a negative impression, prompt do, uh, deeper due diligence elsewhere, um, and just you know, kind of maybe slow down some momentum or raise bigger red flags. So you know, there are bigger picture things to be aware of. Yeah, David, that's actually a really good good point. So my my experience in selling a past business, I um, I had this schedule of exceptions, right, uh, um, on the on the stock purchase agreement, where I had to document all of the exceptions to the things that I was representing for the business. So are are you saying that, hey, if I knew if I knew right that somebody was a contractor that should have been an employee, technically, uh, I need to document that in my schedule of exceptions. You would, and you'd probably continue to have, um, you know, legal liability in your purchase and sale agreement because you're right. in a whole section of indemnification, um, and you know you are basically, generally speaking, responsible for everything that happened on your watch up through on my watch. Right, right, right. Okay, so what was seemingly kind of a, 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 a what I thought was a savvy business decision. Um, may may actually have come back to to bite me a little bit, given that I was looking um, to um, sell the business. Okay, I got it. And you know, you have insurance and other things, and you know, that's a topic for another day. Sure. And, you know, employment practices. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Additional coverages are very important. You know, this, yeah. this is exactly um, okay. So. Um, Next, uh, well, actually, let, let's talk a little bit more about some specific risks uh, from the worker's perspective. So uh, if, if this was kind of flagged as a misclassification or potential misclassification, the worker could have, uh, you know, the IRS come in and, and seek back payment for, uh, with interest and penalties for Social Security and Medicare. Um, they would likely also take a hard look at other aspects of your return, you know, which could include a spouse. Um, you would probably look at those business expenses that you're claiming. Um, needless to say, all this is time consuming. You'd incur CPA and legal expenses and is stressful. You know, I can't say that the, the likelihood or the, you know, percentage, um, um, instance of, of these things happening in any situation is high, but you know, it's one of those things where you have to kind of also calculate not only the, the likelihood, but the impact if, if it does happen. Um, for the employer, the risk of misclassification, again, um, you know, seeking back payment, interest and penalties, Social Security and Medicare, um, the employer has a duty to properly classify and withhold taxes. Um, additionally, um, as applicable, state and local taxing authorities may also seek taxes that would have been owed for a properly classified employee. Um, could also trigger, again, broader tax matter scrutiny in the course of an audit of these activities. Um, the employee for the worker could 
um, or, or contractor who may have, may have properly been classified as an employee could later raise concerns about the classification, about not being an employee, um, seeking back benefits, things such as PTO, health, um, overtime wages. Mm -hmm. They could file unemployment claims, which could also result in impacting your premium rating going forward for unemployment insurance. Um, so, you know, there's a broad host of things there. And, you know, if you want kind of offline to look into some of these things, um, there's some recent, fairly recent Uber cases in Massachusetts and California that resulted in settlements of more than $100 million. Um, again, you know, big bullseye, likely to get more scrutiny, but um, there's a ever-growing body of law around these things. So let's jump to slide five and then six. So talk a little bit about this guidance. slide, this slide Dave, uh, key concept control. Yeah. So okay. compens uh, classification guidelines, are you, should they be a contractor? Uh, should they be an employee? Um, you know, Scott and other CPAs can speak more directly to this, but you know, these are guidelines, like most things with the tax code and employment law, there typically aren't bright line rules. Um, there's, you know, pronouncements and uh, cases and other things that, that you can look to for guidelines. And, and, and that's um, what we'll touch on a little bit today. So um, I talk here about this key concept of control. So an independent contractor should have control over their own activities. Um, what does that mean? So first bullet here, experience and expertise. By their very nature, they should be someone who has a reasonably significant amount of experience and expertise in the area. You know, they're an SME that you are bringing on it's not somebody straight out of school with no working experience that you're gonna have, you know, doing this project. Um, and uh, so, you know, the sort of a, the thing has to speak for itself a little bit, it has to kind of pass the, the smell test. Um, how do they work? So um, I, I speak here about materials, um, you know, are they using their own um, equipment. They have their own laptop. They have their own phone. They have those things that aren't company provided. Typically, and a contractor should have their own materials. Um, judgment and supervision. This is a significant one. They should be able to make their own decisions about how best to complete the work. The supervision should be fairly minimal. And in most cases, it's really a, you know, a matter of sort of checking in with milestones, reviewing the deliverables to see that they're acceptable. But they don't have uh, you know, a manager that they're directly reporting to, let alone you know, having to sit in on meetings uh, on a very regular basis and sort of look over their shoulder. Um, when and where, uh, so when, you know, they should be able to perform the services, which again are, are typically, you know, deliverables, um, whenever it's convenient for them. They may have a delivery deadline um, or a general time frame, but you know, if they wanna work at midnight in their pajamas or, you know, whenever around their kids' schedule, you know, that is something that's more, um, common and appropriate for an independent contractor arrangement. Um, said another way, they're not, um, you know, on a set nine to five schedule or expected to, you know, to, to start work and finish work at a certain time. And where, you know, they should be able to do the work anywhere. And, um, you know, it really should be by and large um, remote. 
Uh, it doesn't mean they're not in the office or checking in the office, but they shouldn't have a dedicated space. Um, you know, in, in good independent contracting arrangements, a lot of your clients have some shared workspace. Uh, when they come in, they might, a contractor might come in, you know, once or twice a week and they're in a, a meeting room or a common space or they have, you know, cubicles or areas set up for them. They come in and they plug in again their own device. So um, I think you get a, a feel for it. And, and again, none of these are bright line, hard and fast. You have to tick every box, but this, um, all of these things are factors that would support either an employment or an independent contractor classification. So David, just to stop right there for a second, because there is some gray zone um, or some it depends answers. I want to create some space. Does anybody have a, a, a hypothetical question? Like they have a friend who um, scenario that they want to run by David here. Yes. I, I, go ahead. Yes. So uh, this is Justin from bud.com here. I have a hey, friend David. as it happens uh -huh. who, um, uh, and, and, uh, in order to, to bring on new people during the, the sort of initial phase, they hired people as contractors on a three month term to see if they were gonna work well together with the plan that they would transition to full-time employment after that initial period. During that initial period, the person, the contractor used their own computer, they had a set deliverable set of tasks. It was essentially full-time uh, and with a lot of you know, deadlines and deliverables and regular meetings, but they were working from their own home, the hours they kept. Um, I wonder for that, that intention of doing a, a, a ramp, you know, temporary to perm as a test probation period, if there's any, if that changes any of this math, or if it's better to sort of bring that person on right away as an employee, or if that contractor thing applies because they have their own computer and their own, you know, hours and, and workspace. Great um, question. It is a great question. I think that's a good segue to, uh, to the next couple of classification items. Um, so, 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 you know, the, the quick answer is it depends. Um, I think that that could work, but then we're looking at compensation structure and we're looking at duration and some other aspects of the arrangement. So, you know, you said some things there that, um, you know, are, are good um, and again it kind of that so they're using their own equipment they're working remotely um, you know I would have questions about you know their the independence of their work and the level of supervision but, but nothing that you said there you know threw off any huge bells um, so let me let me talk a little bit about um, compensation which is this uh, slide I think it's slide seven, there we go. Um, so they shouldn't be paid, generally speaking again, a regular wage or it's not advisable if you wanna have a contractor arrangement that's gonna stand up to scrutiny to pay them you know, X per hour um, or you know, a, a salary or something like that. Now, Sorry, David, so, so when you say, I, I, I'm not sure I understand that, so when you say not paid a regular wage like don't pay by hour or don't uh, sorry what did you mean well it's preferable and you're going to be in a much better position to defend the arrangement if they are paid on a project or a milestone basis project or milestone okay so you know let me give the example uh you know you're going to hire a contractor to do some web development or idf work and you're going to say hey when you complete this you know we're going to pay you five thousand dollars and there might be interim milestones or something like that. Um, and, and so it's, it's paid on a, a, a per project basis. Now that is going to be much better to stand up to, to scrutiny as opposed to, Hey, we're just paying you, um, you know, track your hours and tell us, you know, what, how many hours you are and we're going to pay you hourly or we're going to, you know, you know, give you some sort of quasi salary type of, of thing. Um, and then another very important part of this is, are they truly an independent contractor that holds themselves out 
as being available to do this work for other companies. Right. You know, are you the sole um, person that they're doing work for? Now, that doesn't mean that, that, that that's going to rule it out because, you know, hey, they might do, you know, essentially full-time, fully focused projects uh, for one um, owner right. or one company at a time. Yeah. But then, then we're looking to the next issue, which is duration. So mm -hmm. our, if you're going to be paying them, they're sort of solely doing work for you during that compressed focused period, you know, how long does that last? Is it, you know, months, uh, you know, just kind of as a general guideline again, um, on the, the duration, which is, uh, this, this next slide. Um, yeah. You should have you should have a fixed duration in your independent contractor agreement, or at least have, you know, these fixed milestones where you can clearly know when the work is done. But you should have, um, you should have objectives or a target date for completion of that. And generally speaking, independent contractor arrangements shouldn't last for more than a year, or they're going to raise some red flags. Um, you know, then it's, it's, it's much harder to explain how they aren't, you know, essentially employees that you're doing it for, for their convenience, uh, structuring them as something else. Um, David, David, let me ask you a question. So, um, so a question came in here, a hypothetical question, of course, a uh, resource was hired on for an initial three month contract contract kept working thereafter for a year doing tech support work with customers employee has run into a major medical condition and has had to stop working. What sort of risk and concern could the company face? Should we take this question offline? Okay, fair. Um, can you see yeah, that? Well, you know, that falls under up above, you know, so if they yeah. were, you know, if they were deemed adjudicated, whatever, to have been an employee, so then you as uh, the owner employer could potentially be responsible for uh, for benefits, and if they're not on your plan, like all the other employees, then you've been paying premiums. Um, you know your your health insurance carrier is not going to pick that up, and so you the, the employer potentially could be paying out of pocket for that, unless you had some sort of uh, um, unusual uh, insurance coverage. Um, um, not health insurance, but, you know, general liability, professional liability, plus employment practices, they're probably not going to pick that up. So, you know, that, that's a, a real world risk where they could be potentially exposed to that. Um, so it, it certainly helps if you have an, an independent contractor agreement where the worker is acknowledging between them and you that they are an independent contractor and they waive any benefit rights and so on and so forth that isn't necessarily a be all end all where they couldn't kind of pierce that contract um, but that that helps um, the, whatever you put in the in, independent contractor agreement though is not going to carry any weight with um, the irs or state or local agencies if they want to get involved but it, it may with a, with a civil claim from an employee. Um, but, you know, with that three month kind of rolling or evergreen situation, you know, best practices are you have, you can have like a master independent contractor agreement, but you should have a statement of work for each project or for that three months. This is what they're going to be doing during that three months. And then if you want to roll into the next three months, you can, let that independent contractor agreement still govern it, but you should have a new statement of work. It says this is what you're going to be doing for this next three months or for this next project. Mm -hmm. to deliver this. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that, that's best practices there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. okay. Can we, can we tackle this next one? I, I, I love the questions flying in. Um, can you see this by the way, David, on your screen or um, the chat box? Okay. Yeah. 
Well, I'll see I'm, the check box. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm a co I'm a co-founder of a new business. This is a great question, by the way. I'm a co-founder of a new business that's providing transportation and companionship for elderly. We're trying to determine if the people providing this care should be employees or contractors. Oh, there's some good, uh, there's some good, um, I think, case law about this. They will use their own car and be part-time, but we will likely instruct them on what to do and we'll pay a set hourly amount. Would love any thoughts you have. Uh, maybe there's some parallels with some of the Uber cases. What's your, what's your lens, David? Well, you know, everything that, that we've already said applies. Um, yeah. So, you know, we're, we're, we're and layering on top of that, what I would say is, you know, anytime you've got um, a, you know, sort of a protected population um, like elderly or, or children, um, the, the public interest in that um, goes, goes way up. And so the, the likelihood of having scrutiny goes way up um, from, you know, all sorts of regulatory agencies um you know probably doesn't for the irs but it, it does for the for the others so i i would say that if um that's a situation where you may want to exercise more control over the staff which would necessarily mean um a, an employment arrangement uh might be more appropriate than it otherwise would. Um, you, you know, would would probably want to have broader um, private insurance for that. And so, you know, I talked about employment practices coverage, or you know, things that employees do that are wrong or harmful. Hmm. Um, you want to have you know some professional liability in addition to general liability coverage at, at the company level for their activities. Um, you'd certainly want to have um, pretty robust uh, auto coverage. You know, if they're using their own cars, you, you'd want to make sure that you have non-owned, meaning non-company owned auto coverage um, for their activities. Um, you know, it, it touches on a lot of things, Russell. Uh, yeah. So that, yeah, yeah. Su super interesting. So there's a there's a there's an insurance component to this and a coverage because what you're saying is I'm you're you're you're, you're liberating contractors to act in their own accordance I, uh, subject to the contractor rules but given that we're talking about dealing with the elderly there's 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 standards there's protocols right and so if you're mandating protocols right you start to get into that okay control element which isn't a, a requirement that they be an employee, but if yeah. they're not an employee, then thinking about your broader insurance coverage to mitigate against some downstream risk would be, would be valuable. I think that's right. I think we come back to the class, one of the, the main themes of the classification, which is control. And to be an independent contractor, you really have to have your own independence and uh, ability to kind of determine how you're going to do the work. But that just doesn't seem to lend itself to that type of, um, business model. And I think that there would be an expectation uh, mm. from regulatory agencies or, or, you know, the public or the clients that you would, as an owner, control the, the, that staff. Yeah, and yeah. have independence to sort of do it however they best see fit. Yeah, uh, yeah. And you probably want to have some, do some, you know, background checking on these people and do some due diligence on them, but that has to be done properly because most localities now have these right to work statutes here in Washington they do and in Seattle they're particularly kind of vigilant about that where it's it's really extensive the things that you can't do based on a background check and how you have to go back and give the candidate or employee the ability to answer any questions and you can't take certain kind of discriminatory action and hmm denying them a job or firing them based on what you found. So, you know, that's a real thorny area of background checking as well that you'd want to talk to. Mm -hmm. an attorney. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Ron, great right. question. D yeah. Next one. These are, these are awesome. Okay. Hypothetically, if you had a company where you used a number of different consultants and paid them per project, typically three months or so. So this, this all makes sense to me. 
and use them for multiple projects with multiple clients, do you need to have an independent contractor agreement or statement of work for each project? Or can you have an overarching contract, kind of like a master agreement with that independent contractor that covers any work they do with you for a period of time? I, you, you can, I think you could have kind of an overarching, I, you know, I think the point is that, that you'd be wise to have these, uh, you know, statements of work or say the, what they're going to do and how long you expect it to take or what the milestones are. So if you had a bunch of little things, you know, um, and it wasn't like just one distinct, discrete project, you know, I, th I think that's fine. But the idea is that you want that to be um, specifically tailored and to help you support the classification. And yep. you know, so for the next three months, you want to take a fresh look at it, sit down with them and say, okay, what are we doing? What are the, the multiple projects? How do we define success? Um, you know, how do we measure it? How are we paying them in such a way that it's kind of tied to the actual achievement of these things? Right, right. And again, not to get too crazy tactical, but um, you could like set up a, a template in PandaDoc, for instance, it's a, an SOW template. And just as that uh, contractor takes on more clients, um, easy to push out a, a templated, if you will, statement of work that if for no other reason, it just demonstrates the milestone nature of the relationship, sort of like an added safeguard, if you wanted to do that, not essential, you could do it. That's right. And you okay. know, this really isn't just kind of Oh, go ahead. You know, doing your paper vacation. I mean, done properly, it, it really should help align the business goals and the workers' goals. And get everybody on the same page and doing it in a, an efficient way. So yeah, 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 I get that. You to be really thoughtful about how you're structuring this project and how you're going to pay them. Yeah. I mean, and and just um, because Robert had a um uh, another hypothetical follow up um. And on top of that, what if someone is a 1099 that you asked to come on as a W-2, but they wanted to stay independent? Well, again, uh, you know, I come back up to the, some of the comments at the top. And, you know, th that's usually what drives it is they want to stay independent and they want right. it because, you know, maybe they legitimately they are an independent contractor. They want to be able to do jobs for other people or moonlight or do multiple things. Um, but you know, they want to run some expenses through and, and, uh, you know, they have more flexibility there, but what the owner has to be aware of is that they've got the bigger target and that they have a responsibility to properly classify. So that's all fine. If they think that they can, um, support the classification based on, you know, kind of the totality of the the classification guidelines we're talking about here. Yeah. But, you know, you, I think you'd be foolish to just say, okay, I'm going to do this for the employees or workers' convenience. Right, right. I, it makes sense. And um, I'm going to ask, uh, there's one more question here. And Zubin, feel free to jump in if I'm not capturing this correctly. I mean, you can jump in and, and, and talk to it. So let's assume we realize the company needs to change the way it's been operating. So, A, we, we realize, right, we need to make a change in terms of contractors and should be rolling its contractors over to full time. And so if we make full time offers work um, with our CPA or PEO, so I'm not ent entirely clear on that with our CPA or PEO and bring them on. Have you seen contractors try to make back claims against the employer? Like, Hey, we're trying to do the right thing. We're, we're doing the transition, but then I get this back claim. Any advice toward managing the transition? Like what's been your experience, David, if a company feels like, yeah, we need to make a change. Do they actually expose themselves <laughs> in their effort to do the right thing? Well, you touched on it there a little bit. Um, number one, you, you, you want to get your professional advisors involved and you want to do this thoughtfully and, and strategically. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to talk to your CPA. You would want to um, understand if it's appropriate to do any sort of, um, you know, kind of retroactive action, um, whether that's with taxing authorities or with the employee. And you want to draft up a very, very carefully tailored offer letter um, or at-will employment agreement 
Um, I say at will, meaning that, you know, they can be terminated at any time for any reason. Yeah. Clear that they, they are that. And you can include in that, you know, you would kind of summarize the, the, the compensation terms and what the benefits are, but you can get a release at that point. I mean, you're, you would be bargaining for a, you know, for a job and you can, you could say, Hey, you know, they, they give the, the company a general release uh, from any and all past um, claims. Again, that's not going to really hold any weight with um, any, you know, federal or, or local authorities that may have tax or other um, issues that they come in with. But as between the, the worker or employee and the company, right. Well done, well drafted, that should, you know, hold up and, give you a clean slate from any claims from them. Mm -hmm. Great, great point on the release. Yeah. Okay, cool. cool. Uh, the next slide, I think I have it as nine. Um, we've talked about this quite a bit, but, you know, documenting the arrangement. So businesses at a minimum should have an independent contractor agreement. They should have well-tailored statements of work. Um, there should be a duration, whether that's a specific time period or a, a milestone and deliverable, um, and they should be updated. Um, 1099s absolutely should be done. You know, you get your initial paperwork when you bring them on as a contractor, you issue the 1099s. Um, so, you know, that's, that's not going to insulate the employer um, from, from all issues, but, um, you know, you, you absolutely need to do that. Mm -hmm. Question, David. Um, I, I've had a situation where, uh, or sorry, there was a hypothetical situation where we had a, uh, a contractor that we paid um, based on the terms in the statement of work, meaning they didn't invoice us. They didn't invoice us. Mm -hmm. is, is that okay? Or it's just a factor, one of they many should, factors. You know, best practices are that they invoice you. Okay. Okay, good. For that statement of work. And okay. you know, as an owner, I would want to, you know, if I'm not getting an invoice from them, I want to bug them or ask them to submit it and, you know, just maybe even say, you know, in order to, to process your payment, we need, we need an invoice from you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, okay. simple template, but um, yeah. Okay. So that, yeah, that, that is recommended. Um, Next slide, I just want to touch on a couple of other um, it related issues and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Um, so, non-compete and non-solicitation issues. Um, you know, generally, as a company, as an owner, you, you've got a lot more latitude in obtaining these, what I'll call protective covenants from an employee as opposed to a contractor. And that just kind of ties back to some of these factors that we talked about before, because you know, the expectation is the contractor is holding themselves out to be doing work for other companies, other clients, whereas the employer is expecting um, full-time dedicated service to them which would mean that you know you you could obtain um, a non-compete agreement where they say hey you know we won't engage in this similar activity um, you know with anybody doing anything substantially similar to what the employer is doing during our employment term and for some tail period after the termination of the agreement so you're you're not likely to get that and, and it wouldn't be appropriate and it might undermine your classification in an independent contractor agreement. But in an independent contractor agreement, you would be wise to, in some situations, if not most, have some non-solicitation protections and certainly have a non-disclosure agreement in there that's specifically tailored to, to them, to what they're gonna be doing and what they're gonna have access to. You know, are they going to have act, direct access to clients or client names or client lists or, you know, proprietary information? Um, you want to make sure you protect that. And you might want to say that, hey, you're not going to solicit any of our 
um, clients. You're not going to solicit any of other staff or employees to try to come work for you or another client um, and have some of the kind of standard protections that, that come with those um, covenants. Um, IP protection. Um, again, non-disclosure agreement, you know, in almost all cases where they're going to have it, any access to your sensitive information, you want to make sure you get that in place. Um, and that it's a well-drafted non-disclosure agreement with injunctive relief, which means you can go out um, without a lot of expense and, and motion filings and get a, a protective order to keep them from, from continuing to do that. But real world, um, you want to be thinking about their work environment. Um, and IP security vulnerabilities. You want to be in most situations, you know, using a VPN, limiting what they can actually take and put on their machine or the environment that they're going to be doing this work in where they're accessing your, your sensitive information. So just be aware of that because again, if they are, you know, kind of the, the classic independent contractor working from home, working on their machine, maybe working in Starbucks or other unprotected, you know, um, wireless environments, um, you know, have some um, security protection in place. Uh, so, you know, that and these days, you know, Amazon workspaces, there are a lot of solutions out there. Um, use them. Uh, so with that, let me just throw it over to a, a general Q&A. We can come back to any of this stuff. Yeah, awesome. Uh, so there was another question that came in just around the, the method of invoicing. So Robert asked, could, could you ask them to say use Expensify to submit their invoice or like you, use my system to submit your invoice versus doing it um, uh, in a different way? Uh, does it matter? Um, sure, you could. I think you can't be too insistent on it. Again, you know, the, the general concept here of, of control, you know, they should be able to, as an independent contractor, decide how they're going to um, invoice you. Mm -hmm. um, so, hey, there's a question that came in. They have a question around the new California freelance law, Dynamex Operations W versus Superior LA County. It's creating a lot of weirdness in the advertising industry. Are you familiar with that case? Any? Yeah, I'm generally familiar, and you know, we get bulletins and we follow some of that stuff. Um, I practice much more in Washington. California is, you know, at the vanguard of a lot of um, of employment law, and they are, you know, widely considered to be the most um, employee friendly state in the union um so you know I, I can't really get into specifics about that but i'd be happy to um you know offline chat about um any any particular issues um sort of implications from that yeah, but I think, I, um this is uh magnus i just asked the question um yeah so um i'm just reading off of another of a blog post i found online here and um this has been a problem for people like me um, working in, in advertising for art directors, designers, copywriters, creative directors. Um, there was a law that basically, from what I understand, is very Uber-like. It was a, a delivery company who had their delivery people hired as contractors and not um, as employees. Mm -hmm. And... Um, the California Supreme Court, I guess, didn't like that. So they have like an ABC test. And one of the things you can test is that um, the worker performs work that is outside the usual course of the company's business. But if you're a freelancer working for an advertising agency, you're doing exactly <laughs> the core um, that the agency is doing. Or if you're a programmer, um, working for a, you know, a, a startup, building up some sort of platform. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
and this law, I think, came into effect just a few months ago. So I don't think anyone that I've talked to knows how to attack this. Like I go in and out of projects all the time. Um, and I do exactly what the company I'm working for is supposed to do. <laughs> Even though we follow basically all the other stuff that, we, that you've been going through this past hour. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I think, you know, they're, they're apples and oranges. I think we, when you're talking about, you know, I, I don't mean some disparaging way, but when you're talking about, you know, delivery people or things that are, you know, relatively low skill level and experience, um, I, I think there it's, it's more appropriate to look at, you know, is it within or outside of the company's kind of core business? When, when you're talking about something like, you know, advertising and, and, and those types of things that are where the contractor is doing something that is in the core competency, the core business of the, the company or the owner, um, then I think you look to uh, more towards the um, experience expertise um, factor that I talked about above, you know, so are, is this person experienced, uh, you know, highly experienced and have a lot of expertise such that we want to, you know, kick this project over to them to execute with their control, you know, with their professional right. determination of how, when, where they're going to get the work done and deliver it. And, you know, I think if you can still, you know, meet all those other criteria and show that, that, you know, that work is being independently done, particularly if you are a contractor doing regularly doing projects for other companies, um, you know, I think that that should stand up to scrutiny, but I'll have to go back and look at that specific, uh, you know, California um, development. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great question. Any other questions? Hypotheticals, of course. David, are the rules getting um, more restrictive or more lax? And does that change with administrations? Like, where's sort of the political influences here, if at all? Like, where are we trending in this area? Um, I think that it, it, probably the biggest driver, at least, um, you know, at the federal level and Scott or others can speak to this, um, is, is budget driven, is resource driven. So, you know, the IRS is pretty constrained in terms of what revenue officers they have to go out. So they've got to kind of prioritize and decide what they're going to go after. Right. Um, you, know, you know, I guess sort of politically speaking, um, you know, that doesn't mean that this subject matter can't be a, a priority. Um, but, you know, the, in this current environment, the likelihood of going after, you know, what I'll say a, sort of the smaller fish or people, you know, other than an Uber or, you know, Microsoft back in the day when they had all the permit yeah. temp um, litigation is, is, is lower just because they don't have the resources to pursue it. But, um, you know, um, that, that doesn't mean that state agencies and um, um, wouldn't, wouldn't prioritize these things. Um, it just yeah. kind of depends on the local administration or, you know, who's Bob Ferguson's in the AG's office in Washington and, and they want to focus on this. So yeah. Uh, yeah. a lot of times though, you know, when you're talking about employment, you, you know, you're, it's, it's really has to do with every individual relationship. You know, you have some um, disgruntled worker that wants to go and start a dumpster fire and, and, they, and, and they'll find somebody to represent them. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> I know it well. You get to your people and, um, you know, agreements and documenting these things and statements of work sounds tedious and maybe <laughs> overly it. Yeah. On a 
on a fundamental level, just like purchase and sale agreements and all that, yeah, it, it prompts everybody to get in the weeds a little bit and talk about the issues. You know, it's kind of like a prenuptial with a marriage. I mean, yeah, mm. have, have some tough conversations and talk about these things and say, hey, so if this happens, here's how we would deal with that and here's our understanding. But if, yeah. And the things that you otherwise might not have specifically discussed and the worker had one thought and the company had another and there was a disconnect. Yeah. Yeah. So. We have about three minutes left. So I'm going to, I'm going to wind down. First of all, David, I want to thank you so much. Uh, as important, I want to thank everybody that decided to attend virtual office hours today. Um, we're going to take a little hiatus next week. Uh, I couldn't find anybody that wanted to come on and participate next week. I mean, I, I, why? I have no idea. No, it's the holidays. So uh, happy holidays to everybody. And we are going to pick back up on January 8th. Uh, we have Mitya Kirat, who's going to be on. And he is a sales consultant. And he's going to be talking about kicking off first quarter sales and some strategies around first quarter sales. So I'm excited about that. David, super helpful today in grounding us in an issue I think that we all face. And I would say for me, eight times out of 10, I sort of swept it under the, the rug, right? Didn't really think through the, the implications, but boy, better to start off on the right foot and get things kicked off with good process so you don't get surprised down the road if you're raising capital, if you have a disgruntled employee, if you're selling the business, yeah. right? It just makes sense to plan a bit in advance. So thank you uh, very much. And uh, everybody, I'm Russell Benaroya from Stride, and it's just a pleasure to host uh, virtual office hours. So David, thanks again, and happy holidays to everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.